Now, before we start this episode, we want to extend our thoughts and prayers to all that were affected by this case. The case of Carly Ryan is from South Australia in a town of Stirling in Adelaide. This town is very quaint and quiet. There are about 250 souls living there. Carly was born on January 31st, 1992. She was a lovely 14 year old teenager. She lived there with her younger brother and her mom, Sonia who adored her daughter. Sonia did have Carly at a very young age, and having Carly did save her life, she said, and it made it a purpose. The two had a very special bond. They had become best friends. Sonia had said that Carly had a great sense of humor, and she was so full of life. Like many teenagers, Carly, at her age, and she had her own flair of dressing and also expressing herself and how she wore her makeup. When she got in her teen years, she did start hanging out with some kids that were not a really good influence on her. At one party, Carly had got alcohol poisoning. When she got home from the hospital, she told her mother that this had really scared her and she was gonna make some changes in her life to distance herself from these type of friends going forward. With this, she wanted to get a new group of friends. Now at this time in 2005, social media platforms was in its infancy. The, these media platforms made it easy to make friends from all over the world. Now this did attract Carly to get on her computer and make some new friends. It didn't take long at all. She had went on and got a MySpace account. At this time, MySpace was very popular for many years. It was the most visited site at that time. Carly was excited to be making new friends. She would tell her mom all about the friends that she was making. She'd also joined the Vampire Freaks and it started as a social networking site. She had made one special friend, and he was a 17-year-old teenager named Brandon Kane. He went by the name Corrupt Koala. He had told her he was an inspiring musician, that he lives with his dad in Melbourne. Carly was falling hard for Brandon and fast. They would talk online all the time. Sonia had noticed that the relationship was blossoming that every time Carly would talk about Brandon, she would giggle and have a huge smile on her face. Like any mom, Sonia was worried about the age difference. She would keep an eye out on their conversation as best as she could. As Sonia would go up behind Carly to check up to see about the conversations and it just seem like normal chit chat about their hopes and dreams and music and places they were going to visit. Now, Brandon also would make friends with Carly's friends. Her friends were happy for her and how the two had a great relationship and it was blossoming. Brandon and Carly eventually having a long distance romantic relationship was talking all hours, day and night. So I just started to come around with their relationship though. And Brandon's dad, Shane, was okay with the relationship. He would even go online to post remarks on their comments the two couples were making. Sonia had said that Carly had an emptiness inside about not having a father figure in her life, that Shane was helping to fill that void. It was Carly's 15th birthday party. She had invited Brandon to come over, even though the lovebirds have never really officially met. Now to Carly, this was the perfect time for them to meet in person. However, 
Brandon had called a Carly and told her, unfortunately, he could not make it. Carly's heart sank when he told her that. But he did suggest that his father would come over and bring her the gift from him and that he was going on a work trip. You see, Shane did work in security and sometimes it would take him around to many cities. This did seem to make her more a little bit happy when Brandon had suggested this. Then Carla came running in to hand Sonia the phone telling her that Brandon's father, Shane, was on the other line and that he wanted to introduce himself to Sonia. Shane told her mother that he would love to drop a birthday gift off from his son on the day of her birthday. That he would like to meet the family of Brandon's new girlfriend. As a mother, she felt odd about him calling and coming over, but finally did agree, only because they had been talking online to each other for many months. On the evening of Carly's birthday party, Shane had arrived at the spot that Sonia had said that she would meet him. You see, she didn't really want him to come over until she really wanted to feel about him. He was dressed in a uniform, and then he showed Sonny his badge that had his name on it. This did make her feel a bit more easy. And she said he seemed polite and friendly during the visit. As they went into the house, Carly was on pins and needles till finally Shane had come over. So she was very happy and excited to finally meet her boyfriend's dad and get to know him and hear all about Brandon to even get to know him better. Shane gave Carly the birthday gift from Brandon. When she had opened it, there was underwear and a nurse's outfit. Shane was with Carly most of the evening by her side and his erratic and possessive behavior Carly started getting kind of uneasy, but she did not want to defend him. And she wanted him to like her friends and her too. She did not want to make a bad impression. When the party was ending, Shane said that he was going to get a hotel room for the night. Sonia suggested for him to stay the night since they do have a spare room and that he traveled all the way to meet them and she'd be honored to have him stay in that room. He finally accepted the invitation to stay. Then in the morning, Sonia was getting ready and had walked by Carly's room. And in horror, she saw Shane on Carly's bed and he was fully clothed on top of the covers. Also, her friends were in the room as well. Sonia was shocked to see him in her room. She had demanded him to get his things and leave. He did not say a word. He took his things and drove off angrily. Her mom had told Carly, it doesn't matter how much that she likes Brandon, that she did not like Shane the way that he was in her room and on her bed. It just turned her stomach. The whole thing was wrong. Carly did tell her mom that Shane did do something inappropriate, physical advances to her that night. Carly rejected him, but Carly still was devastated and wanted her mom to patch things up so she could still see Brandon. But this was too much for Sonia. She just couldn't get over the behavior of Shane she did tell Carly she was going to cut the internet off and take Carly's phone from her. She did threaten that she was going to call the police for the actions that he did toward Carly. Carly had begged her mom not to, and she couldn't bear to think of never talking to Brandon. Then as time went by, eventually Sonia had did give Carly's phone back to her on a condition that all communications with Shane stopped. Then Sonia had emailed Shane and told him that he is not to contact her daughter. And if he does, she will get the police involved. When he did respond to Sonia's email, she was shocked at what he wrote back, that he was not that polite man that she met earlier. 
he was vicious to her and that he was threatening legal action to her for defamation of character. He called her a pathetic and gutless bitch and that if Carla keeps seeing Brandon, he will have her move in with them and Sonia would lose anyway. Carly was in a slump from what had happened. It was about a month later since her birthday party. It was on February 19th. Sonia and Carly would spend the morning together. Carly was painting her nails because she was going to go over to her friend's house for a sleepover. Sonia had talked to her friend's parents and they had planned this for a while. So Sonia knew all about where her daughter was going to be. And by now, Sarley seemed to be back to her old self. She was excited about spending the night with her friend's house. When it was time for her to leave, they gave each other big hugs, four times in fact. When one would hug each other, the other pulled back and they would hug each other again. As she skipped off out the door, Sonia said that Carly had turned to her and says, love you, mom. She saw her daughter walk down the street. The next morning on February 20th on Horseshoe Bay, Port Elliot, it's almost about 50 miles from Adelaide. The police were called out to the Horseshoe Bay from an early morning walker saying that they saw a body of a young woman facing down in the shallow water. Right from the start, they knew this was no accident. She had been raped, beaten, and drowned. When it was nine in the morning, Sonia had called Carly's phone, but it was shut off. Now, Sonia knew this was very unusual for Carly, that she always had her phone glued to her all the time. And as she hung up, she had a gut feeling something was wrong. I guess it was a mother's instinct, she said. She was going to call her again and got a call from an unknown number. When she had answered it, the caller said, is this the home of Carly Ryan? I had just found her purse on the side of the road. The location of where the purse was found was a long way from where Carly was going to stay at her friend's house. Sonia's heart started to race. Thoughts were entering her mind to where her daughter was. She called the house of Carly's friends and in horror, the parents said she never showed up. Sonia immediately called the police to report her daughter missing, telling them what she wore the last time she saw her. The police informed her that they had just found a body of a young girl that did match to what she was saying her daughter looked like. Because there was no ID next to her body, Sonia had to go over and see if it truly was Carly. The whole time driving, she kept saying it couldn't be her, it just couldn't be. Sonia saw the nail polish. She knew it was Carly, her daughter. Was not long that the death of Carly was on the news and her friends would find out by turning on the TV and seeing Carly's picture. The death of her shocked the community. No one would ever think of who could hurt Carly and want to kill her. The detective noticed where the area of the beach where she was found, there had been a struggle. Her jewelry was torn that she wore and had been broken and it was all over the ground. Police did find the tip of a latex glove and blood droplets in the sand. The autopsy showed Carly had 19 separate injuries and six to eight of those was blows to the head. The main cause of death was due to facial trauma, smothering and drowning. It did show that she had beach sand in her mouth and she had cannabis in her blood. Then the investigators started to collect the camera footage of the surrounding areas. One of the cameras showed Carly walking with two males down the boardwalk at 7.04 p.m. There was a witness that came forward and said that they saw two men that fit that description where Carly's body was found and it was just before 10 p.m. that night. The witness also said he did remember seeing a pale blue car alone in the parking lot near the beach. The witness did say that 
he doesn't remember the plate number on the car, but he did see a security badge, and it was near the window of the passenger seat. No one knew how she got there on that beach, and it baffled Sonia and Carly's friends. As the investigators looked over the camera footage, they also was looking at Carly's internet interactions, who she was communicating with, and the only name that did kept popping up was Brandon Kane. The investigators noticed that Carly and Brandon did have a romantic relationship with finding these messages. They also found some real strange emails and messages to Carly's friends. To the investigators, it seemed that Brandon was trying to keep Carly away from her friends and that he was, over time, being more aggressive and nasty to them. They not only wanted to talk to Brandon, they wanted to talk to Brandon's father, Kane, as well. As they were investigating the death of Carly, Sonia told them about what had happened on Carly's birthday and what Kane had pulled with the inappropriate behavior that he did to Carly. Sonia also showed them the email that she got from Kane after the incident at the party. The investigators needed to know the couple of the numbers that Carly was talking to a lot from this phone company. They had traced them to Melbourne to Adelaide. The numbers had went from Melbourne to Adelaide and both were en route at the same time. This was on the night of Carly's birthday party. Eventually, the investigators did link the names and addresses be turned out to be fake. Now, the investigators did not know who was actually on the other side of these phones. Some of the calls that were being used was located at a small place called Walkersville. It was just a few miles away from Carly's home. There was an RV park in Walkersville. Investigators have thought maybe that they stayed there. Police had got a hit of two males that fit the description and drove the same kind of car that the witnesses saw. That they did stay in one of the cabins in the park. The car that they drove had an address in Melbourne. The detectives now have a lead to finding out who these people are. They were the last known people to be with Carly the night that she was killed. When the police had located the address and went there, they saw a pale blue car parked in the driveway. As the investigators walked up, they did see the security badge in the window. This address was not connected to Brandon nor Shane. It was the address of a 48-year-old father of three, and his name was Gary Francis Newman. Carly had been dead for about 11 days, and they had arrested Gary. He didn't say a thing at the time of the arrest. The investigators had been searching his home, and in his desk they opened it and found a stack of pages that had names on them with passwords and emails. Gary had more than 200 fake personas. Among those, of course, was Brandon and Shane. When he was arrested, he was on the computer, and as they looked at the computer because it was open, they saw more chats open and him talking to young girls. He was using the same name that lured Carly, Brandon Shane. He had used many photos, even used family's information to complete his ID. Because he did use the family's information, it was a form of some truth. The police had found a camera that was taken from Carly's house on the night of her birthday party. One of the pictures was that of Carly and Gary, but she thought he was Shane. The security badge and uniform, of course, were all fake. It was found out that the young man that was seen walking with Carly along with Shane or Gary down the boardwalk was actually Gary's own son, a 17-year-old. He was hired by Gary to play Brandon that day, but this information has not been confirmed. The mountain of evidence against Gary, he could not explain his way out of it. On the night of the sleepover, Carly had made plans to meet up with Gary, also known to her as Shane. She had waited 18 months to meet the person that she fell for online, which was Brandon. Carly badly wanted to go and she 
said that she would not tell her mom. They drove to Horseshoe Bay and according to the evidence that Gary had made advances to Carly and of course she refused them. And then Gary then assaulted her. He had sat on her back and pushed her face into the sand. She was a small framed girl and she could not fight him off. However, she was unconscious when Gary had left her in the water. She was still alive. She had drowned due to her being unconscious. It is speculated that Gary's son had witnessed it all. Question is, did he participate? They did find some beach sand in both of the men's shoes. The forensic evidence states Carly had fought for her life for 30 minutes. In 2009, Gary had went to court. Only Gary's name had been released to the public. As of today, his son's has not been released. Gary wanted to enter a plea of manslaughter, but this was rejected by the prosecutors. His son had pleaded not guilty. All throughout Gary's trial, he had said he had been diagnosed with bipolar and OCD, and he was asexual and not, had no interest in sex. He claims that he was a father figure to Carly, that he had talked to her through Shane's profile and not Brandon's. He did blame his 17-year-old son for chatting with Carly on Brandon's profile, that he had made that profile to talk to other girls and also Carly. The prosecutors said that they believed that both Gary and his son used both of the profiles to talk to Carly. Gary had admitted that they all went to the beach that day and that they were saying their goodbyes and then they left. Gary told the jury that he had offered Carly a ride, but she declined it. He also said that he didn't even know what happened to her until three days later. He said that he had called Crime Stoppers to even help find the killer. Gary's son did testify against his father saying that the day at the beach, he did see his dad make advances toward Carly. She had walked away and that is when his dad attacked Carly and hit her from behind. At the time of the court hearing, now 19 year old, he said that he never participated in killing Carly, but he did admit to helping his dad cover it up. Gary's other son also testified against his dad. He said that the day after the Carly's birthday party, when he had come home, he was angry that Carly refused his advances and that he vowed to get back to Adelaide and he said, fix Carly up. His son also said that his dad had bragged about what he did to Carly, even showing the bruises on his hands from hitting her. At the time, his son did not believe him or take him even seriously. The jury took two and a half days and 10 hours to deliberate. Loved ones and friends were worried that Gary would get off scot-free. Much to the relief, the jury did come back with a guilty verdict, with a sentence to life, with a minimum of 29 years parole period by Trish Kelly. Now, Gary's son, who was with his dad, did not participate in the killing of Carly. He was cleared of all charges. The jury said that they believe he deserves a second chance. Gary had made an appeal on several grounds. One was that Sonia should have not been able to give evidence at his trial. It only took five months for this appeal to be denied. With what Gary had done, and to the degree on which he lured her, he led to what is now called catfishing. At the time of Carly's death, networking online, social platforms were so new, no one would ever think of doing that of what Gary did. The death and the murder of Carly was the very first death in the world of being lured to her death from an online predator. 
Carly's murder also inspired her mother to make it her mission that this does not happen to anyone else's mother and father to go through what she had. So the, the issue there, I suppose, is you can have someone talking online uh, and you have to, I suppose, wonder, and I'm sure this is part of your preachings to politicians, what real reason is there for someone of age, for an example, someone in their 40s, to be lying about their age talking to someone, but at the moment, no action can really be taken, essentially? Not until they have evidence of that sexual purpose. Um, so yes, there are so many people online, um, police are dealing with this all the time, um, pretending to be, you know, a 12 year old or a seven year old child or a teenager, trying to create connection and lure children. Um, this is becoming, unfortunately, a really common crime in this space. And so what we want to do, again, is give police the power to intervene soon the current grooming laws um, basically are saying, you know, we have to have that, that sexual evidence. So. In 2010, Carly Ryan Foundation was established. This is a certificate online safety program under the office of the e-safety commissioner. Then in June of 2017, the Carly's law came in an effect that people lying about their age to minors could be prosecuted. That same year the Carly's Law was used when a pedophile in his 30s had been posing as a young woman and he had been grooming children online. A quilt had been patched together by Carly's favorite clothing and it was hung up. Ryan wants to warn of the dangers. Well, most kids just don't think it's going to happen to them. They put all their information on their MySpace and Facebook and they don't think about who could be looking at their information. To grab the attention of teens, Ms Ryan has spent the past week interstate touring with bands, handing out this internet safety pamphlet to concert goers. Once I'd read the brochure, came to me and said, oh, you know, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for this information and I'll pass it on to my friends. So far, 20,000 pamphlets have been distributed and now sponsors are needed to pay for another printing run. A website will soon be launched. Sonia Ryan's also giving talks at primary and secondary schools around Adelaide, but her cause could get the ultimate boost. The foundations approached Oprah Winfrey in the hope she might agree to publicise it when she visits in December. And hearing you talk about it now, it's obviously still very, very raw. Yes, it is. And, and, and it definitely is very, very difficult, um, especially in the beginning, the first year. Um, there would be times when I would finish a seminar and shake um, and be physically sick. Of course, there are physical traumas from something like this. And it is difficult. But what the reward is, is that children come up to me afterwards and say to me, thank you so much for helping me. I'm going to go and check my friends list on the computer now. Um, or when we get a call from people, parents saying you really influenced my child's behavior on the internet, I can't thank you enough. Carly's mom, Sonia, still fights to this day to keep Carly's voice alive. She hopes that Carly's law will help prevent others of a child's death by the predator. Well, this is it for today for this case. I'll be on to the next bizarre case for you guys. Thank you so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. Until next time, you guys take care and be safe. Bye.